Good evening. I am Cheryl Drazen, the Vice President for ADL Central Division, where I have the pleasure of working with the amazing ADL professional teams in Austin, Houston, and Dallas. This legislative session, those teams have collaborated to amplify our advocacy statewide, from coordinating volunteer leaders to draft a two drafting testimony and executing our successful phone to action advocacy alerts, Team Texas has taken seriously the commitment to fight hate in the Lone Star State. Coordinated through our Jean and Jerry Moore Civil Areas Rights Council, Rachel Bresner, I want to specifically thank Lisa Humphrey for her tireless leadership this session, as well as Leah White and Margie Levin, who is responsible for coordinating this evening's webinar. When ADL was founded in 1913 by three attorneys in Chicago, the opportunity that democracy brought to fulfilling our mission was paramount. Understanding that systemic change could be effectuated through the branches of government, ADL focused on moving the needle by on relying on working within the system. Fundamental to this strategy was the notion that the United States offered its citizens the right to engage in the most basic element of our democracy by a participatory voting system. As you know, ADL's mission has not changed in more than a century, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. In order to do this work, a fair elections process is essential. For that reason, ADL has always been involved with voting rights and has leaned in most recently as the challenges of a global pandemic impacted voter access in ways we could have never contemplated. This legislative session, the issue of voter suppression in Texas has been front and center, and we are fortunate to be able to explore it in depth this evening. In order to be in communication with our esteemed panel, I encourage you to place questions as they come to you in the chat by using the icon located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Moderating this important conversation will be my colleague, Karen Levitt. Karen Levitt is the National Civil Rights Council at ADL. In her role, Karen advises policy and drives advocacy on civil rights issues, including voting rights, immigration and refugee rights, LGBTQ plus rights, domestic extremism and criminal justice. She provides strategic, legal and legislative guidance to staff around the country and in Texas on civil rights issues and advocates for policies that further our mission including the need to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Prior to joining ADL, Karen served as a staff attorney in the Juvenile Rights Program at Legal Aid Society in New York, where she represented young people in family court proceedings. Karen, we welcome you to Texas this evening, and we look forward to learning from your conversation with our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Cheryl, I appreciate it. Uh, and Rachel and the Texas team ADL have been doing an amazing job. I really consider myself lucky to be able to work with them. They've been working nonstop. Um, but welcome to all those joining us tonight and welcome also to our amazing panelists who have graciously agreed to take the time to share their knowledge and their experience about the right to vote with us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them about anti-voter efforts and what the average person can do. Uh, Anthony Gutierrez is the Executive Director of Common Cause Texas. Prior to joining Common Cause in the summer of 2016, Anthony worked in Texas politics for 15 years. That experience included nonpartisan work, doing advocacy for Latino communities, as well as partisan work as a staffer for the Democratic National Committee and the Texas Democratic Party. Anthony has also managed several successful political campaigns for candidates running for federal, state, and local offices. Eliza Swearen Becker serves as counsel in the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. She litigates voting rights cases, counsels lawmakers and administrators on voting legislation and policy, researches voting law trends, and comments on voting issues in a variety of media outlets. Eliza previously served as a Ford Foundation Fellow in the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, and as a law clerk in federal district court in California. Uh, as you may have seen on the slide at the beginning, ADL is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. Our focus is on ensuring that people have free and fair access to voting, not on telling them who to vote for. To that end, our voting rights advocacy focuses on making sure that people know how and when to vote, that they're actually able to do so, which 
unfortunately is no small thing, and on combating misinformation and disinformation about the election process. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions today. We've set aside time for questions and answers towards the end of the program. Simply submit your questions via the Q&A section at any point during the session. So let's get to it. Um, let's jump right in. Almost 300 bills related to voting have been filed in Texas this legislative session, most of which erect deliberate barriers to voting. Some, like SB7, have attracted a lot of attention because they cover a lot of ground, while others are really narrow. Anthony, Eliza, which efforts do you see as the biggest threats to safe and accessible elections? Yeah, I can I can jump in. The um, so it, it it is hard to pick. There's there's a lot there's a lot going on. Um, but the you know SB seven is probably the biggest one um, that has already passed both chambers. Um, and you, you know if, if people have been following that one, like there's sort of some provisions that watered down the worst parts, but it's still really really bad. And it's at a point in the process where all the bad stuff could get put back in. Um, for us. The most concerning things have to do with um, top of my list is the poll watcher provisions. Um, and if people aren't familiar with what a poll watcher is, basically this is uh, someone appointed by a campaign or a political party or just kind of any entity that's on the ballot. And they're supposed to do, you know, what it sounds like. You're supposed to just stand there and watch. If they see something bad going on, they're, they're supposed to be able to tell the presiding judge or the election worker. And there's sort of procedures there for, you know, what happens next. Um, what the bill would do would empower these poll watchers in really dangerous ways, allowing them to do stuff like potentially videotape a voter while they're receiving assistance, which if you're someone who needs assistance, what that means is you're, you're either disabled or probably uh, need language assistance of some kind. So in many ways, like the most vulnerable Texans would be subjected to some poll watcher just aggressively trying to get in their face with their cell phone. Uh, the, the bill also would, uh, change how a presiding judge can kick out a poll watcher if they are trying to intimidate a voter. It, it basically, the, the current version of the bill, um, they, they, they get to commit two crimes before you can call law enforcement to come kick them out. Like, it sounds absolutely outrageous. And this is actually a better version than what was uh, like originally introduced. Um, you know, beyond that, just like things like uh, limiting early voting hours, like preventing, um, a, uh, counties from being able to send out applications to vote by mail. Like, you know, all these other states are trying to expand vote by mail, allowing everyone to vote by mail or allowing like more people than usual. And, and in Texas, they don't want you to be able to send out an application. It's, I feel like I can go on and on. I'm sure we'll get into some more of the other ones, but those are probably the top of the ones I have on my list. I would add um, just some national context that Texas is not alone in introducing so many bills to restrict voting access. This is unfortunately a national trend. We're seeing hundreds and hundreds of bills introduced for the 2020, 2021 legislative session. And one of the things that I think is most dangerous about this trend, and it's certainly present in Texas and motivating the provisions that Anthony just mentioned, is the, the false narrative and the circular logic that is being advanced to justify these provisions. Um, we had a former president and many state lawmakers, including those in Texas, um, spread lies about uh, voter fraud, about election irregularities, and then create a, a sentiment of distrust in the election. And then now we're seeing those same lawmakers point to that distrust and say, we have to do something to solve the lack of confidence um, that they themselves have created by advancing these lies. So the, <clears throat> the, the pretext of uh, voter fraud and election irregularities is just that, it's a pretext to advance these provisions to make it harder to vote. Um, and we are seeing that play out in SB7 and many, many of the other bills um, that are being advanced in Texas. And one of the trends that is featured in SB7 and many of the bills in Texas that I also think is a cause for um, concern is the um, increased criminalization that is included in all of these bills, including in SB7 of both voters and election officials. So voters who might make an honest mistake or election officials who make an honest mistake are subject to criminal penalties, including felonies. And what that's going to do is discourage people from participating in the process. 
We worry that it's going to discourage people from volunteering to serve as election judges. We worry that it's going to discourage people like election judges from stopping interference by poll watchers because they could be subject themselves to a criminal penalty for protecting voters and, you know, quote unquote, interfering with poll watchers. And then voters might be discouraged from participating if they worry that one little mistake is going to send them to prison. And unfortunately, that is not something that is um, unheard of in Texas uh, with respect to uh, voting errors. Um, so that's that's something that's particularly concerning in many, many of the Texas bills. Um, and unfortunately, a trend that we're seeing in states across the country as well. I just want to follow up on what you've just said, Eliza, about basically voter criminalization. And Anthony, what you had also said about poll watchers having so much more power and at the same time, poll watchers being empowered to commit crimes on the flip side of this are We saw in the 2020 election that the, there were definitely marginalized communities that had less access to voting, more obstacles to voting, to the extent that that may or may not have been the case in Texas, and you two are certainly the experts here more so than I am, in what ways will these laws have an impact on marginalized communities? On the criminalization piece, I think it's important to um, recall that the false claims of fraud that were being levied last year were targeted at you know, particular cities, uh, Detroit, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Philadelphia. Um, what do those cities have in common? They have big populations of black voters. And so the connection between allegations, false allegations of election fraud and voters of color is very intimately linked and unfortunately has a long history. Um, you know, the history of voter suppression in this country is, is cannot be divorced from the history of trying to keep black and brown voters and all voters of color from the ballot box. And so provisions that are that increasingly tie our legal system to voting infractions, I think is going to have an even greater burden on voters of color because we know that the legal system disproportionately all burdens Americans of color across the board. So the more that you intertwine the criminal justice system with minor infractions, I think that's going to increasingly discourage voters of color from participating because they are more likely to be subject to unfair investigation, unfair prosecution, and then over penalization for those very minor and often accidental infractions. Yeah, I think I think similarly, um, the poll watcher piece. So we we um, just as part of our election protection work, and we do kind of digital monitoring of, um, of right wing groups that engage in this type. We we got our hands on a training video um, about a month and a half ago, where the Harris County Republican Party was training poll watchers, and the the speaker points to sort of the Anglo predominant suburbs of Harris County and says, what, what we really need is we need to recruit 10,000 uh, really brave people to serve in our election, uh, election integrity brigade to come down here. And he points down at the black and brown communities and sort of the urban core of Houston. We need to have our brave poll watchers come down here to really catch the voter fraud. And I mean, just all, all the dog whistles just go off listening to this video and understanding when you think about like what he means, like what he means for these people who are supposed to do nothing but watch to like need courage to go into these communities to do whatever they're going to be training them to do. Um, and, and, and just sort of the poll watcher, the, the, the mechanism of a poll watcher itself, like they're just a long discriminatory history tied to um, why, that, why that exists in the first place. Um, so that, I mean, I feel like it absolutely falls under, like that is something that is going to be weaponized to use against black and brown communities um, and the other one that, you know, I feel like this, this is not in the current version of the bill, but could be put back in, um, that sounds innocuous when people hear about it is there was a provision in the original version of the bill, um, that would standardize the number of voting machines that get placed at every poll site in the county, which sounds fair, right? But when you do it that way, instead of, um, allocating voting machines by like historic turnout or population or things like that. Um, well, we saw it, that actually is exactly what they did in the Democratic primary in Houston in 2020. 
And if you all remember back then, there was these infamous stories of like eight and a half hour lines on election day because the pulse, the, the machines were all in the wrong places. The, they were, they had way too many where they didn't need them, too few where they needed them. Uh, so, you know, I, somebody saw that and decided, oh, we should codify that. Let's do that on purpose next time. Uh, which, you know, the, the, the places where all the long lines were, were the black and brown communities in Harris County. But, but. So with this many anti-voter bills being proposed and with this kind of serious impact expected, how do you, in your respective roles, effectively respond to all of them? It's a, it's a big job and it's done by, you know, lots of us at the Brennan Center in coalition with organizations across the country. So um, there are a lot of organizations, including organizations um, like ABL and Common Cause who are working on this. Um, but there, and there are a number of different tools in our toolbox. I mean, it, we have advocates on the ground in states um, who are um, working to organize um, folks to call in, who are working to lobby legislators against, to advocate against these bills. Um, one of the things we do at the Brennan Center is focus on public education. So we produce um, reports and information and disseminate that across the country so that people know what's going on. They know what's going on in their states and they know what's going on across the country and they can get galvanized and, and call their own state lawmakers and say, you know, please don't pass X bill. Um, when these bills pass, uh, and we've already seen this in Georgia and Florida and um, Iowa and Montana, folks are gonna go head to the courthouse and litigate and challenge, um, challenge the new laws and contest their constitutionality, whether it's under state law or federal law or other violations of federal law. Um, we, we are working um, you know, in coalition across the country to try to advance federal legislation that will protect voters. And then at, at the end of the day, when we sort of see where things net out, organizations across the country are gonna be doing that education piece again and trying to teach vo their voters what the new rules are because things are, will have changed at the end of this legislative session one way or another. And folks are going to need to relearn maybe how to vote by mail or what the rules are to vote by mail or the new calendar that they have to um, register by. So there's a, there's a lot of work on the back end once we see um, what policies are actually in place to make sure that um, even when voter suppression rules are enacted, that voters have as many tools as possible to overcome them. Yeah, I think I think the other two things I would add is like first um, I was, was having this conversation earlier with just like it's so late in the session, I'm so tired, how are we gonna keep going? And that what we concluded is like, it, we, we're really fueled by outrage at this point. Like what they're trying to get away with is ridiculous and you just can't let people like do what they're trying to do without putting up a fight as much as you possibly can. But the, the other piece, you know, it's in, in Texas, it's been this really, it, it's a really kind of amazing, interesting phenomenon over the past, like I would say like three, three, maybe four years. Um, there, there's an election reform coalition that really works during the legislative session on all the voting bills and, you know, try to help the good ones and uh, stop the bad ones. And it used to be a group of like, I had like seven of us, like, you know, three sessions ago where we just kind of have one committee room. Um, that group today is, I, I don't even know how many organizations it is, but the calls are twice a week and it's like at least 50 people on those calls, which is a little cumbersome, but also exciting that, you know, there's all this energy just people are just really galvanized. And there's this, the, the coalition that works on this today, I mean, it is groups like the Brennan Center and like Texas Civil Rights Project who have this amazing sort of policy expertise and legal expertise and um, grassroots groups like Move Texas and Texas Organizing Project, um, advocacy groups. And I mean, the list goes on and on. And it's just people bringing energy to it that like you didn't see in prior legislative sessions. I mean, the it, we, we shall see what happens with SB7 and some other ones this time, but, um, you know, you, you'll recall this last legislative session, um, SB9 was their big omnibus voter suppression bill, and that one died in the last, you know, the closing days of session because there was just this really amazing sort of energy, unprecedented amount of energy around voting rights issues in Texas that was able to sort of brought to bear in defense against that one. Well, fingers crossed for this one. Also, we'll be talking later on about what all of our viewers and participants today can do to maybe help SB7 die. Um, 
But before we get to that, Eliza, are there any proposed federal laws that would affect these attacks on the freedom to vote? Yeah, there are two um, big federal packages that would protect voters. Um, the first is the For the People Act, that's HR1 and S1. So it was the first bill introduced in the House and the Senate in DC this year. Um, and it is really an omnibus uh, democracy, democracy reform bill. It contains lots of election reform provisions along with redistricting provisions, money and politics provisions, uh, ethics provisions, but the election reform provisions and with which I'm most familiar and I think will have the biggest impact in, in mitigating um, these the state voter suppression bills that are advancing uh, include things like automatic voter registration, same day registration, policies that are already in place in lots of states across the country, other policies like online voter registration or limits to protect against improper purges, stronger protections against voter intimidation and deceptive practices, stronger protections against baseless voter challenges that can be levied in polling places, um, restoration of voting rights to people with past convictions who are living in the community, um, early voting period. Uh, so all of these policies have been successfully implemented again in states across the country and not just blue states. Um, there are red states that have had these policies and used them uh, for many, many years without issue. Um, so it, it is a it is a comprehensive bill that would mitigate some of the very policies that are being advanced in Texas now. Um, and then alongside the For the People Act is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which is a bill to restore the Voting Rights Act. And many people may know that in 2013, in a US Supreme Court decision, um, Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court gutted one of the key provisions of the Voting Rights Act that required states with a history of discrimination to get approval when they changed their voting and election policies. So one of the things the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would do is rectify that process so that what we call pre-clearance um, could happen again, that states with a proven history of discrimination would have to get approval before they could change the rules. Um, the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would also do a number of other things to protect voters. Um, but the goal of that bill is to protect voters so they don't face racial discrimination at the ballot box. So the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act really go hand in hand to lift the floor across the country with respect to voting access and voter protection. And along those lines, uh, Anthony, have you seen any recent pro-voter developments in Texas? I know we've talked a lot about anti-voter developments. Yeah, it's a, surprisingly enough that there are a couple of little bright spots that I can point to. Um, so there was actually one that we were working on today, um, sending an alert to our members trying to get people to make some calls. Um, it's it's a ranked choice voting for military and overseas voters. Uh, currently in Texas, if you if you're in the military, if you're overseas, um, you there's sort of the window you have after an election if there's a runoff. Um, it's oftentimes not long enough for people to um, get their ballots, fill out their ballots, send it back. So what this bill would do is create uh, basically an instant runoff system. Like the, if you're in the military, you get two ballots. One of them you fill out is just like a normal ballot like anyone else's. The other one is the ranked choice voting ballot, which um, if people aren't familiar, you're basically like ranking all the candidates. If no candidate gets over 50%, then you eliminate the lowest one. And their votes, the second choice gets distributed until somebody gets to 50%. Um, lots of states do rank choice voting for many offices, not just like overseas stuff. Um, and we, we hope to one day get there, but you know, just, just being able to do it for military overseas voters would be an incremental sort of forward step for us in Texas. Um, the other big one, and it's oddly enough, it's in SB7, the massive, just like super ugly voter suppression bill. Um, but one amendment that, um, we were really pleased got on that was a, a high school voter registration amendment. Um, it, basically there's in, in Texas, there's a requirement that every public high school, um, every, I'm sorry, every high school uh, offer voter registration twice a year to every qualified student. Um, it is an amazing law. It's surprising that it's on the books in Texas. The problem is schools don't do it. Like when uh, in 2019, when someone did an analysis, it was 13% of schools that were actually complying with the law. In, um, 
the earlier this year when the more recent analysis was done, it went up to 30%, but 70% of schools just don't do it. So what the amendment would do is require the Secretary of State to check with the Texas Education Agency, figure out how many or find out how many voter registration cards each school needs and proactively send them. Which again, amazingly enough, they don't already just do on their own, but they would be le legally obligated under this bill. So it's, um, you know, again, it's, that is a, the high school voter registration law is, it's flawed in a lot of ways. There's a lot of reasons you don't have compliance. And we, we worked with uh, Representative Mary Gonzalez to craft a whole comprehensive bill just on this. The amendment is kind of just one small step and there's still a lot more to go, but um, it's Texas. And, you know, we're gonna take the small ones that we can get. So that's that is one really, really good uh, pro voter reform that hopefully remains on in conference committee. So to circle back to, sorry for the corporate term, but to return to uh, what we had brought up earlier, what can the folks who have joined us tonight do to get involved regarding all of this legislation? Well, I think the folks who are in attendance have already taken the first step, which is to learn more about what's going on and to get invested in the legislative process. Um, the, the first thing I always say, and it's a given and it's an occupational hazard that I have to say, but please vote. Um, and vote not just in you know the big federal election, presidential election that, it, that happens every four years in November, just the congressional elections every two years. Vote in your state and local elections too. Those make a big difference. Your state lawmakers are the ones making these, advancing these voter suppression laws in the state house now. And your local officials have a big impact on uh, how election policy is implemented. So it really matters to get involved in the electoral process, even in the little elections that are maybe inconvenient for you to show up at. Um, it, it, is, it is critically important. Um, so, and make sure your friends and family, if they're eligible to vote, are registered and they get out and vote too. Um, the other thing I will say is you know, to get invested in the legislative process um, year round. I know Texas doesn't have a year round legislature, but, but participate, call your state lawmakers, ask for a meeting with your state reps, your state senators, um, call in and say, I, I want you to support this bill. I want you to vote no on that bill. State representatives, much more than your federal representatives, are responsive to constituents and they will, they will take your calls and your meetings more than you might expect. Um, and it matters to them what you think. So even if you think your representative is supportive of the policies you care about, it's still worth calling in and letting them know that you have their back and you will support them in whatever vote you expect them to take. And even if your representatives you think are, you know, completely opposed to the policies that you would want to see advanced, it still is going to matter to them how many vote, how many calls they get saying, please don't pass this bill. Um, so it's, it's worth making the calls and, and writing the letters and emails. The same is true for your federal representatives, particularly on, for the people, on the For the People Act. Call your senator, write your senator, ask them to pass S-1. It's before the Senate already. Um, and then, you know, support and engage with groups that are doing the work on the ground, um, you know, with Common Cause Texas, with other groups in, the, in coalition with them, whether it's volunteering your time, um, whether it's supporting them financially, if you can, making calls when they're asking folks to phone bank, whatever you know you can give to support the efforts. I am confident there are many, many organizations on the ground in Texas that would be delighted to have um, the help and support. So those are some of the things that you know I always recommend. Yeah, did, did you know everything Eliza just said? Um, also, we absolutely would be happy, overjoyed to have anybody support. Um, so I, I can give you a couple. So I think first there's one, one very specific one, um, the ranked choice voting for overseas. This, this bill made it out of the house. It's in the Senate, it's in committee, but um, oddly enough, the author of Senate bill seven, uh, chairman Brian Hughes, it's his committee. We need him to bring the bill up for a hearing for it to move forward. Um, so call him. <laughs> we, if you go to lettexasvote.org, this is our advocacy website where we do all of our sort of uh, combating bad voter stuff and trying to help some good voting bills. Um, we just put up a call to action. There's his his Twitter handle, his email, his um, his office phone number. Um, 
just some calls in to just tell him, hey, bring the bill up for a hearing. Just give it a shot to like have the hearing and have the vote. Um, and, and the other one is the our, our, our advocacy website. It really sort of is what Eliza was just describing about being engaged. Like, I think we realized in Texas a long time ago that we can't just be focused on trying to win some stuff during the legislative session. Like if we're ever going to pass big pro voting reforms in Texas and be able to really stop the bad ones, like it's gotta be a permanent thing that we're doing all year round, just building power and organizing. And, and that was the concept behind Let Texas Vote. Um, it's a campaign that sort of combines trying to pass local reforms all over the state with building power and like grassroots organizing to in between legislative sessions, build power so that, you know, in 2023, hopefully things like online voter registration or automatic voter registration or any of the long list of things that every other state does except for us will actually have a chance at passing. Um, so those are the two that I would give you for now. Um, I think we're about to post also um, an action with all of the contacts for the, um, the conferees who are on the conference committee working on Senate Bill 7. At the very least, we want to demand that they do not put in any of the really, really terrible stuff that's already taken out of the bill. Um, and ideally, they could just, you know, stop working on that one and just not do it. That would be nice. So we're going to jump into the Q&A portion in a minute, but we did have a question specifically about that. Uh, or related, which is whether there's any chance to amend the partisan poll watcher enhancements in conference to restrict them. Well, Anthony know. may have more intel on this um, than I do, but my understanding from the way this conference is working is that literally anything can go into the bill at this point. Um, it can be really harsh provisions that have already been pulled out through the amendment process. It can be provisions of bills that have already died that were unrelated to SB7 and HB6 throughout the legislative process. So certainly I think there is there is room, there's lots of room for improvement. Um, I don't know how, how likely um, those that, that is, but I think to Anthony's point, folks should reach out to their to the conference committee participants and, and demand the changes that they want to see in the bill. Uh, I, I, you know, the process is not particularly transparent, but I think the more that they hear from voters, the better. It certainly can only help. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the only thing about that, that is, I agree with all that. Um, so there is um, a, a thing you have to do before conference committee if you want to bring in new things that haven't been in a prior version of the bill. Like they have to have passed a resolution basically getting sign off from both chambers and it's like a it, it, it's not like a majority vote, it's like a fairly high threshold. So I don't, I don't think they can bring in like in super new things that aren't germane to what is already in the bill. I think they could fix the poll watcher piece so that it's not this incredibly just like moronic, you get to commit two crimes. Um, I think the problem is kind of like, that's just such a, like it's, if people have ideas, would love to hear them. Like we've been sort of talking about this internally, just like, how do you fix that? Like, how do you, it, I mean, the, the way that should work is the presiding judge has the authority to kick out a poll watcher if they're doing something wrong. Um, unfortunately, that's the current law and that's what they're trying to, to change. So, I, I, you know, um, they, they could just take it out of the bill. That, that would be one, one suggestion we could all make to them. So let's, let's go ahead into the Q&A portion of the call. We've got about 20 minutes and we're gonna do our best to address as many questions as we can. Uh, one of the questions we've been asked also about SB7, if that bill or some of the other voter suppression bills pass, has anyone done an analysis of how many people might be disenfranchised? It's a great question and one we get a lot at the Brennan Center because we, we work hard to you know, back up all of our advocacy with data. It's not really a, a question that's possible to answer in advance um, because the effect that a bill is going to have is, is you know, really impossible to measure when you think about all the factors that's up, that go into whether people turn out to vote. Um, we, we know based on past experience what kinds of restrictions tend to depress voter turnout, uh, but we also know that um, American voters are very resilient and they have been overcoming voter suppression for as long as 
um, this democracy has existed. And so often voters overcome even, you know, the most vicious attempts to suppress their right to vote, um, which doesn't mean that those um, voter suppression provisions are okay or acceptable. That shouldn't be what American have, voters have to face. Um, but it's really not possible to predict ex ante the, the depth of the um, sort of depression in turnout. Um, it's something we look at very closely after the fact. So for example, one of my colleagues did an analysis of early voting in Wisconsin, or excuse me, um, voting in Wisconsin during the um, primary elections when lots of polling places were closed, particularly in Milwaukee. And we saw voter turnout down by 8% just because of those polling place closures and voter turnout was down 10% among, um, among black voters in the city. So it's something we can look at retrospectively, but it's very, very hard to predict looking forward. Yeah, I don't, um, I did, did a, no, no like analysis as far as like how many would be impacted, um, but there was, I think it was the ACLU, somebody did an analysis of looking backwards at the 2020 election and looking at some of the things that SB7 would try to um, prohibit, like drive-through voting and just did a racial impact analysis that it wouldn't tell you how many people are impacted, but it would tell you what communities. And um, big surprise, it was like black and brown. So voter, voters were predominantly the ones using um, drive-through voting and also the ones that were uh, after hours voting. So like extended, like voting after 9 p.m. Um, that was predominantly like, you know, shift workers and again, more like the black and brown communities. So, um, that is the thing that came up um, uh, a number of times in both the Senate and House hearings groups like the NAACP and MALDEF asking the bill authors like, have y'all thought about this? Have y'all done a racial impact analysis to see who would be affected? And, and of course, of course they said no, but um, some groups have done that. It's pretty clear who would be impacted and um, it would be, it would definitely be a negative impact, but like Eliza said, it's, it's really hard to put a number to until afterwards. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions about the federal bills. So if the For the People Act passes, what exactly what would that do to SB7 or, or any Texas bill? Would it automatically nullify certain portions of SB7 that are in violation? Would there have to be a lawsuit against Texas? Would the Texas bill still have to be repealed? This is the question that has been posted. So the way that election law works in this country is admittedly, you know, confusing on its face because states get to create election law for their state elections and their fed and federal elections that happen in their states. Um, but the Constitution also says that Congress can write federal election law and can override any federal election law that states create. So the For the People Act would implement the, the rules that I described, automatic voter registration, early voting, uh, provide drop boxes, mail ballot access for everyone. It would implement those provisions for federal elections only. And so the state law that pertains to state elections would remain in place. So it could theoretically create a scenario where the rules are bifurcated for state and federal election law. Generally, that's not how things work in this country because it's an you know, election administration nightmare to have two different voter registration forms for state and federal elections or to have you know, early voting for federal elections but not for state elections. And so states typically conform their policies to satisfy federal law so we can have um, well-run elections in this country. So, so what the For the People Act would do was implement those policies for for federal elections and that would put some pressure on states to implement those policies in their states too. Having said that, we did see a number of bills, including in Texas, um, where there were you know, state resolutions to oppose HR1. So those are non-binding, but they were expressions of state legislators' uh, opposition to the Federal For the People Act. And we also saw a couple of bills in Texas that, that affirmatively said you know, if the For the People Act passes and there's automatic voter registration, we're not doing that in Texas. We're doing a separate, you know, method of voter registration for state elections, which I can almost guarantee you that every single local election administrator would oppose because it will make their lives completely nightmarish. It is a very, very foolish thing to do. It is 
you know, within Texas's rights to have different election laws for their state elections. It's just, you know, really bad policy, particularly when the federal policy is one that helps Americans vote and something that all, uh, you know, state lawmakers, all election officials should be trying to do. So also uh, on the note of the federal bills, what are the chances that either the For the People Act or the, um, sorry, it literally disappeared as I was asking. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like in the middle of a sentence. My apologies. Um, see, no, nobody is smooth all the time. Uh, or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, will ever make it through the Senate. It's a tough fight. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And, you know, basically one person holds the key and Joe Manchin is that person. Um, I, I am still hopeful. I think there is a path to both of these bills passing. Um, but it's, you know, certainly difficult given the politics of the Senate. Um, I will say that the policies in the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voted Rights Advancement Act are wildly popular when you poll them. Americans of, you know, both major political parties actually like to vote by mail. They like early voting. Automatic voter registration is convenient and it's also really good for protecting the integrity of voter rolls by making sure things are accurate. So these are policies that are actually quite popular and really should be bipartisan. Um, of course, that is not the political reality that we face. Um, we think there is still, a, you know, a path forward for both the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, but that path runs through Joe Manchin, and, you know, I can tell you that advocates are working hard to, to try to move these bills forward and express the urgency that we need, absolutely need democracy reform, we need protections for voters, and what's going on in Texas and the state laws that are passing across the country really underscore that urgency and the need for these bills. And it does seem like at least part of the goal of what's going on with this legislation in Texas is to create confusion. And so how do we energize first time voters or those who are new to casting a ballot? That's our question that I was trying to find the link to answer the question, but while you're talking, um, I'm so sorry. No, no. So you know, this is honestly like it's like, the, what I was talking earlier about, just kind of like all the new organizations we're seeing in Texas getting engaged in these fights that weren't before. Like to me, the most exciting thing, and I, I hope, I think this will carry over and be true for voting as well. Is you know, there's so many groups that are just taking these voter suppression bills as like a challenge. And just like, there's, there are so many young people showing up to testify that in prior legislative sessions, you know, it was uh, all of us who were just, you know, that, no, not in college, not, not really anywhere near college, but I mean, there's so many young people coming and just like, it is, um, you know, that they, they um, if you've watched any of those hearings, those are the moments for me that I really remember when someone is just getting in the, the face of the election officials and just like, this is ridiculous, you need to stop this. By the way, you keep doing this. I'm just gonna keep organizing my friends in my university. Like we're all gonna go out and vote. And I, it, it feels like there is an energy among, in, in particular, like young people that um, hopefully will carry through. They'll just kind of like take this as like, you know, it, it it's, as an act of rebellion to vote, like, oh, you don't want me to vote. Well, that's just gonna make me wanna do it more. Like, as a father of a four-year-old, I feel like that will be true. Like, that, that seems like the natural response that, that young people will have. Uh, we have a very specific question about signature matching. So is there anything in any of the many bills that have currently been proposed, or is there any discussion of adding something? Um, when it comes to signature matching that would involve a requirement that the election commission contact voters before throwing a ballot out in order to verify any suspicions regarding mismatched signatures. Anthony, you may know better than I do, but I don't believe there are any um, sort of notice and cure provisions that are st still alive in the Texas uh, legislature. It's certainly um, something that we're seeing in other states moving. 
um, because with so many more voters taking advantage of mail voting, um, the, the signature matching process you know, comes into play uh, for many more voters. And it's often um, not a well delineated process. There aren't always policies in place as there should be to, to describe how the signature should be compared. But at a minimum, that notice and cure period is really essential because if there is some sort of um, technical defect in the mail ballot or a, a comparison of signatures that, that you know an election official thinks the signatures aren't the same, at least the voter has the opportunity to rectify that um, and to fix that sometimes even after election day, which is you know the recommended policy. But I don't think that that policy is at play in Texas uh, anymore if it really was at all this year. Yeah, why not? The, 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 the standalone bills that would have done that um didn't go anywhere. Um, it is, I mean, it, you know, until that last gavel, anything could be resurrected and amended onto something else, but that there, there is certainly not an appetite among um, the, the people, the, the party that's in power to create the cure process, so unlikely. So I think this will probably be our, our last question before we go to final thoughts. It's, is it possible that parts of some of the many uh, Texas voter suppression bills go against the National Voting Rights Act, um, the federal one? And if so, which ones? This may be a very broad question. Are any of these state laws out of compliance with federal law is the heart of the question. <laughs> um, I, you know, very likely, yes. I would say almost certainly, yes. Um, the, the Voting Rights Act, even as it stands now without the preclearance regime, um, prohibits racial discrimination in voting and, and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act gives, um, you know, individuals the ability to sue and say this provision is going to, is, was enacted with a racially discriminatory intent or has a racial, racially discriminatory impact. And policies that violate the Voting Rights Act that have a racially discriminatory impact or intent violate federal law. Um, and so I think you, you'll see lawsuits brought under the Voting Rights Act alleging that kind of um, racial discrimination. Um, in addition, there are a bunch of other federal laws that regulate federal elections. So for example, the National Voter Registration Act is the uh, federal law that regulates voterless maintenance or voter purges. Um, so the, a number of the purge provisions that we're seeing advance across the country um, could violate the National Voter Registration Act, which also has what we call a private right of action. It also gives individuals the ability to sue and say, hey, this state law violates this federal law and you know, shouldn't be allowed to stand as it is. Um, and of course, there's the United States Constitution, which um, protects the, the right to vote and um, you know, prohibits undue burdens on the right to vote. So I think we'll, we will see um, we will see some of these bills, if enacted, being challenged under the U.S. Constitution as well. And I, have, I have really nothing intelligent to add on the specific provisions, but just wanted to say, like those, um, as a non-lawyer, we um, we have been we we will surely be one of those groups going to court immediately if this thing is signed into law. And we've been having many many conversations with lawyers, and those conversations are really long. It seems like there is a lot to challenge in these bills. So, you know, I, the chances of stopping the bill seem low. The chances of getting something done in court to knock it down or strip out some of the worst provisions, that seems like, maybe, seems like uh, at least better odds there than our odds in the Texas legislature. I mean, on the other hand, lawyers really like to hear ourselves That's talk. Okay. So okay. that might be the other reason you're having more meetings. <laughs> um, all right, so Anthony, Eliza, any final thoughts? I would just encourage folks not to get discouraged. I know that um, the legislative session in Texas and, and in state houses across the country this year have been, you know, somewhat disheartening in the just the commitment of so many lawmakers to try to make it harder to vote. Um, but I but I hope um, your attitude is is the same as Anthony's four year old, which is if somebody is trying to um, trying to tell you no, don't do something that that makes you want to do it even more, and it makes you want to get your friends and family to do it even more, and to to push back even harder. I, I think there really is a national energy in support of protecting voting rights, notwithstanding what's going on in state houses. And I think we're you know we continue to see that in our advocacy efforts. 
We continue to see that at the ballot box where we, ha we had historic turnout last year in the general election. Um, so I, you know, thanks to folks for coming. I think that reflects the same energy as well um, for staying informed and for committing to uh, fighting back and, and just, you know, ask that you, you keep showing up and keep doing the work that you've already been doing. Yeah, 100%. I agree with all of that. Um, it's and obviously y'all, you're, you're on a webinar about voting rights stuff in Texas, you know, at, at 7 p.m. Like at, you, you're clearly very into this and civically engaged, but, you know, just continuing to talk to family and friends and, you know, making sure other people are aware of these issues. Like we, I feel like we live with them all the time, but, you know, when I talk to family, like people are just kind of like, oh, what's going on? Like the, what's, there's a voting bill. Like it's, it's really important people understand these things and get engaged and understand why it's important. I mean, there is, there is a very real reason why the politicians behind these types of voter suppression bills are doing this. And it's, you know, it's all about power and, you know, they, they see on the horizon, like they're, if, if elections are free and fair, they may not be in much power much longer. And instead of sort of trying to come up with better ideas, they try to come up with ways to manipulate elections to retain power. And the way you combat that is just to make sure that when they try to suppress your vote, you don't let them. You make sure that you do show up and your family and friends do as well. And, it's, you know, it, it, it's Texas, it's gonna be hard and it's gonna take a long time, but, you know, making sure that we just keep going forward, keep, you know, getting our incremental successes like the HSVR, the High School Voter Registration Amendment and, and you know, ranked choice voting for military and overseas and doing everything we can on bills like SP7 to just make it hard at every stop, just showing up and testifying and making calls. That's, you know, that, that's what the fight looks like and that's what the path looks like. And eventually it gets us to where we want to go, where everyone can vote and nobody is experiencing voter suppression or intimidation or just, you know, systemic obstacles. That's great, thank you. Um, thank you to Eliza. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us today. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. ADL is part of the Texas Election Reform Coalition, and I know my colleagues in the Texas office are so maybe happy is not the right word, but certainly proud to be part of that coalition and to be working with Common Cause Texas and the Brennan Center. And I certainly appreciate working with those organizations at the national level and all of the incredible work that your organizations do. Uh, for everyone who registered for this webinar, everyone who's still here, everyone who had to step out, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with more information to help you stay educated on this topic and also to follow up in all of the ways that we discussed on how you can stay involved, stay active, be proactive in stopping or furthering the various bills we've discussed.